your um, self when you're not speaking. If you fall off the call, we'll wait for you for a few minutes, but if we do have quorum, we will continue with the meeting. Um, there's nothing to do within camera, so that doesn't apply. We'll move right on then if there's no questions to number one on take attendance. We have regrets from Councillor Wheat. Councillor McAlpine. Here. Councillor Ferrier. Here. Councillor Howes. Here. Councillor Bell. Present. Councillor Pierce. Here. We have regrets from Councillor Chambers. Councillor Miller. Present. Regrets from Councillor Coleman. Councillor Gatward. Present. Moving on then to number two on the agenda, please. Approval of the agenda. Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Miller, that the County of Brant Council agenda for December 8th, 2020 be approved. Are there any additions to the agenda before we begin? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor to accept the agenda as written. Opposed? Carried, okay, thank you. Pecuniary interest, there shouldn't be any. Seeing none, delegations, there aren't any. Move on to number 5A, please, which is RPT 20-229, the new official plan municipal comprehensive review, preliminary findings and recommendation growth scenario. And we're going to hand that over to Jennifer Boyer. She's going to make the introductions to our guests this evening. All right, thank you everyone. I very much appreciate your time tonight. Um, and thank you for the opportunity, Mayor Bailey and Council, to undertake this presentation tonight, which is an important night in terms of our growth management scenario for a municipal comprehensive review as part of the new official plan. Um, tonight, we've got a presentation. I'll introduce it by myself. And we also have our consultant, uh, Watson and Associates. We've got Jamie Cook and also Brad Post. Uh, who are working on our municipal comprehensive review for a new official plan, um, which is the major component in technical analysis and background studies uh, that we're undertaking um, to assert our land needs for the MCR and our growth management forecasting. Um, so what I'll do is I'll do an introduction for about five or so minutes, and then I will introduce Jamie. And he'll take it away for the rest of the presentation, which will outline our technical analysis and to provide a council with some preliminary findings for a draft municipal comprehensive review. Um, we're looking at a preferred long range population housing and employment growth scenario for the county. Um, so at this time, um, we'd be pleased to answer any questions, uh, any analysis, and we're ready to take as many questions as we can all night. And uh, we'd appreciate if you could hold your questions till after the presentation, if possible. We can always go back and forth to the slides and also the report. Whatever you find within it, we can uh, scroll back and forth um, as we see fit to do that. Um, you can either ask the questions directly to our consultant or through myself, and uh, we'll get the best person to uh, find the answers for you. We also have a lot of senior management uh, on the line tonight. If there's any uh, infrastructure questions um, or anything related to employment lands, um, also myself and Pam are here tonight as well. So I guess at this point, I'll ask uh, Heather or Adam to pull up the uh, presentation and we'll start. All right, next slide, please. All right, we'll start with the next slide. So I guess at this point, what I'd like to do right now is just take a few minutes to discuss where we are in the process um, in terms of our new official plan and why tonight is actually a critical piece um, of what is happening with our municipal comprehensive review. Um, I've come to you actually quite some time, um, I've actually four times talking about the growth management scenarios for the county. Um, I've been here before and you've also uh, heard me bring reports if you remember way back in March before actually we got locked down. Uh, it was literally the week before, I think it was like March 4th, 
And I actually outlined uh, in council chambers in person, um, actually what the province was proposing in terms of growth scenarios and what they were thinking about amending the growth plan. Um, I had been downtown Toronto a few times and they were actually the Ontario Growth Secretariat was quite good with consultation with municipalities. They were looking at a different time frame in terms of a long range horizon uh, to 2051. That was part of their consultation. And also looking at different forecasts. Um, in terms of forecasting, I outlined in that uh, report how they come up with the numbers. Um, it's really about uh, residential and employment numbers, but they also look at Ministry of Finance uh, projections in terms of population, uh, cost to the province over time. They revise these numbers every five years. And we are also given a, sort of an overview of how they come up in terms of things that we're in today, which is a disruptor like a pandemic. Um, uh, changes to immigration and emigration throughout the country and what that does to actual forecasting numbers. So it was quite interesting. And then if you remember in uh, August, we actually came to you with some uh, actual findings, preliminary findings, and actually what the province was proposing. And these were three scenarios. It was sort of a reference forecast, as you'd say, a lower scenario and a high scenario. And at that time, they were debating whether to uh, look at the planning horizon to 2051. Um, we also gave you some information in terms of the county was tracking high in terms of a forecasting scenario. And in terms of feedback, council was very clear as to what that meant in terms of the county. If we continued to track to a high residential land needs to the new planning horizon to 2051, and in, in essence, that would be problematic. Um, and then in October, uh, we brought back some of that information to say, yep, the province has actually uh, officially amended as of August 28th. Uh, the new amendment to the growth plan is in effect. Um, they had taken a reference base scenario as a minimum forecast, which is more of a lower scenario. Um, so those findings were actually very interesting to discuss in October to see how this was going to play out. And then I gave you a heads up that um, in the next couple of months, I'd be coming to you with the actual scenario that we would be moving forward with. So there's been actually a lot of uh, work this year that's gone into that. And at the same time, we've undertaken a lot of consultation and continue to work on uh, the official plan and the technical analysis in the, in the background. Next slide. So I guess just in terms of a quick overview, you've heard a lot of this uh, before in terms of what, what are we doing in terms of this actual uh, analysis and for this Municipal Comprehensive Review or MCR as we call it. Um, it's actually part of the Planning Act in terms of our official plan process. And it's actually the real and uh, technical background studies that undertakes the long-term vision and a framework uh, for each municipality to actually look at future residential growth and employment land needs and economic development for the county. Um, so what we're doing is that as part of this background analysis, the long-term growth scenario, it's actually been evaluated in accordance to our actual uh, long-term growth outlook for the county. We also look at regional trends, uh, the growth drivers um, in terms of the broader market area in our, uh, in our greater golden horseshoe and actually what's actually preferred for the county. Um, and Jamie will actually give a very good overview of how the county relates to the actual Greater Golden Horseshoe and the rest of Southern Ontario. Um, and really what we're trying to do as part of our new official plan is to look at a comprehensive growth management strategy and come up with a phasing of development plan to guide our development to really in essence slow down growth um, and have an extra time to figure out our land needs to the year of 2051. Um, and what we'll do is we'll overview the fact that over this period, the County of Brant is projected to grow to additional 19,000 people um, using this preferred forecast. And really what we have to do is look at our consistency with provincial policy. Um, as you know, I've said over and over again, we have to have this conformity to the growth plan by July 1st, 2022, um, but also the provincial policy statement in terms of our land needs, which is for 25 years, um, and also this amended growth plan forecast. 
Uh, next slide. So really the purpose of why we're here tonight, as I've uh, overviewed quickly, is really we're providing council with these preliminary findings uh, related to this technical analysis going on in the background. Um, it relates to really two long range countywide growth scenarios that we are looking at, which is what the province came up with, which is this sort of lower reference forecast or the high forecast um, was also one of the other uh, options. Um, what we're recommending is actually what is preferred. Um, we're looking at the type of growth scenario which is best for the county. Um, this analysis is critical to this point in the, in the process because it's actually component one of our land needs assessment. Without this information and this recommendation, we can't really carry on with our land needs assessment. Um, it's actually going to be used to inform our growth allocations like where and should how we should grow um, in our urban settlement areas and the rural areas. Um, and then that forms uh, how we write the policies for the official plan. Um, so really in essence, this population forecasting is the starting point. Um, it's an important critical component that we actually get this sort of recommended at this, this time. Um, a lot of municipalities undertaking their municipal comprehensive review go through large uh, growth management strategies um, in terms of, uh, you know, what comprehensive plans they have to undertake um, and, and what they need to do in the future. And it all relates to our, our policy objectives. So um, really our outcome though, is determine the best needs for the county for the long range scenario um, and how we're going to slow and manage growth with our phasing of development over time. So next slide. So I guess just looking at uh, where we are in the process, we haven't really moved very far from phase two for most of this year. Um, as you know, uh, COVID did put uh, a bit of a time spot stop in terms of our public engagement process, um, but we feel that we had a very good public engagement uh, with our virtual town halls in October. Um, we actually uh, did a lot of other uh, meetings with other stakeholders and also all our surveys online with our discussion papers. And we've had um, immense feedback, really, uh, emails and calls, um, not just through our website, but people reaching out as much as possible and also through council as well, uh, which has been really a quite excellent. Um, but uh, so we haven't sort of moved on, but really this is like a key phase in the project in terms of where we're going with our proposed policy directions, which is uh, the next step. Um, so here we are tonight uh, in terms of moving on with that, because as you know, uh, it will be actually exactly a year from now. Um, it'll be next December, 2021, that we will come to you with a final official plan for adoption. So. We just have one year left. It sounds like a long time, but it's really not to get all the uh, all the work work done. So, um, but uh, uh, next slide, please. So part of this is we've talked a lot, and even with our council workshop that that we had about six weeks ago, is what do we need from council to ensure success for the new official plan? Um, in terms of actually like, what do we want to see? What are our aspirations and achievements? Uh, making sure that we meet our key dates and also receiving step-by-step -step feedback. So part of this is that um, in terms of when I came to you in, in August, in terms of the scenarios that uh, the province had laid out in terms of the growth forecasting is that we heard you. Uh, we also heard the public, uh, we heard stakeholders. Um, and there's a real dichotomy between the development industry and also in terms of the residents and also council in terms of their vision and what they see in terms of their in the land needs for the county. But we did hear you and we did listen. Staff has considered all approaches in terms of this growth management scenario. As I said, when we came in August, we had expected a tracking high scenario. But in terms of the feedback, we have revised that approach. And that's why here tonight, we have a different preferred scenario moving forward. Um, and also we heard a lot of feedback. Um, we posted a lot of this through our questions and answers for the official plan engagement, uh, through our as we heard it report that staff have put together um, in terms of what is growth, how can we stop or slow growth? Um, how can we ensure we have proper housing options? 
how can we complete communities and have healthy and complete communities? You know, um, it's all about a lot of growth management. And we had some really interesting feedback about what people think growth is and in terms of housing options and what that means. Um, so it was very good feedback. But I guess the point is, is that staff have heard those answers and that's why we're here tonight. We just want to reiterate that, you know, this is really about a, a good scenario and preferred scenario that will manage growth over time. Um, we think that uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the presentation and you'll have lots of comments after in, in terms of uh, what you see for the vision of that. So next slide. So I guess in terms of where we're at at the Municipal Comprehensive Review, we'll talk a little bit at the end of the presentation about what's upcoming in the new year. Um, but as I've said uh, in previous reports, uh, there's five major components to this. And what it is, is obviously we've talked a lot about this growth management strategy. Um, our county land needs assessment, which is residential and employment. We're also undertaking a review of the settlement area boundaries uh, for Paris, St. George, Burford, and all of our hamlets and rural areas and Kingsville. Um, we also are coming up with a housing strategy and an intensification analysis. Um, in terms of housing options uh, for all uh, income levels and also age ranges. And then of course, our very big employment lands analysis, um, our economic drivers of the county and where and how we'll create jobs and opportunities. So next slide. So I, I talked a little bit about the growth management and where we're at tonight, um, but I won't, won't belabor the point, but just just in terms of the actual scenarios, because I've had some feedback already about, you know, what are our options? You know, why this scenario? You know, is it, is, can we have no scenarios or a do nothing approach? Um, and that all comes down to what actually is growth. Um, the county actually has to have fiscal responsibility because in terms of long range planning, and we also have to ensure we have proper housing options and also to create jobs. And the one, one thing Jamie will get into in the presentation is just more of uh, also the Ministry of Finance population projections in terms of our birth rate and mortality rates. And it's quite interesting what you see in terms of uh, age ranges and uh, who's having children and who's not and the actual age range of uh, residents in the county and, and things like that. And really it's about creating jobs for people and economic opportunities. Um, so really, uh, I've also had uh, questions about, you know, can we go lower? Uh, what's our options? You know, does the province have to tell us what to do? Um, and all those are, are, are interesting things in terms of like, we can't necessarily go lower because there's so many factors in play, which it's also about jobs too. It's not just about population or uh, residential land needs, but it's also about the actual uh, um, economic and employment land needs as well. And they have to go together. Um, they can't be cherry picked apart. So, um, so next slide. So Jamie will outline in all the graphs and there's also the attachments uh, to the report in terms of what this reference forecast is or scenario one. And I brought this to you in October about some of the information that the province has undertaken, which is schedule three amendment of the growth plan. Um, and it actually references uh, a forecast, and this was the County of Brant forecast in terms of the projection to 2051, uh, which is over 30 years from now, uh, 59,000 residents and the creation of 26,000 jobs. And then where, we're, where we are today, and a lot of that is in the background material appended to the report. Next slide. And in terms of provincial targets, um, Jamie will also talk a little bit about this, but in terms of what our density target is for new developments and what that means, um, and also our residential intensification targets. A lot of that information we'll bring to you in the new year. Um, that's gonna outline our residential land needs um, for housing options moving forward. So we'll touch on that tonight as well. So next slide. Uh, next slide. So just to not to belabor the point, but we actually do have a policy context that uh, we are following, as many of you know. Uh, I've talked about this a lot. Uh, we've uh, sort of 
talked a lot in terms of our virtual town halls, uh, in terms of the provincial policy context that we actually have to follow. So when we get asked about growth and what does it mean and, you know, is the province driving this? Uh, yes, they are uh, in terms of, you know, what we have to follow. Uh, the caveat of the, the Planning Act and also the Provincial Policy Statement and, of course, the Growth Plan, which is a place to grow. Um, and then under that, our land needs assessment methodology. So all of those pieces of legislation, you can see uh, the Conservative government updated this year. Um, and recently, the land needs assessment methodology and a place to grow amendment one was just at the very end of August. So as you know, we've, we've played catch up a lot this year, but as I've said, we were in a really good position in terms of our timing right now, but the real essence is to try to keep moving forward at, at this time. So um, just one last thing before I, I say this is in terms of the County of Brant being in the Greater Golden Horseshoe and the growth plan, is that every municipality across the province has to undertake a growth management scenario. Um, it just happens to be that the province has done some of our homework for us uh, in terms of a forecast. Um, but other municipalities, either you know, North Bay to Sudbury, down to Windsor to London to Ottawa, is they're outside of the growth plan area and they have to come up with uh, scenarios themselves. Um, which is actually uh, a lot more work. Um, so the province does lay out a certain aspect for us, but it's up to us to determine if that's actually preferred. So uh, without further ado, um, I will actually uh, turn it to the next slide and I will introduce uh, Jamie Cook. Um, Jamie is a land economist and a provincial or a registered provincial planner. Uh, with Watson and Associates. Uh, Jamie's been doing uh, incredible work along with Brad Post and his team at Watson. Watson's been working for the County of Brant for at least the last 15 years. Um, they undertook our 2008 Municipal Comprehensive Review. They've also done our development charges as well uh, with another team. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce Jamie and he can take it away. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and um, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here to speak to council uh, and staff on this important uh, subject matter. Uh, I'm really happy to provide you with our preliminary findings of the MCR and um, walk you through the details and, and uh, have a good discussion. So uh, building on um, Jennifer's introduction, I wanted to just sort of move into one of the first aspects of the work we're doing, which is um, building on the, uh, the provincial policy context as well as the, the county context and working within the requirements of the land use assessment methodology, um, we're required to, um, really what we're doing here is looking at the ultimately the urban land requirements for the county. And so uh, as a starting point, you wanna look at the urban structure and um, we're looking at that urban structure within the context of the um, growth plan and land use assessment methodology. So if I if you could go to the next slide. Um, so in terms of the way the growth plan sets out uh, settlement areas within uh, municipalities, they really uh, define two, uh, two types of settlement areas. One is our urban settlement areas. These are typically settlement areas that are uh, accommodating um, uh, a higher concentration of households of about 400 households or more. They're typically fully serviced communities and are generally more balanced between population and employment. Uh, so in Brant, we have two uh, settlement areas that fall into that de definition, one being uh, Paris and the other being St. George. The rest of the uh, settlement areas within Brant are defined as rural settlement areas. So these are settlement areas that are smaller in, in terms of uh, population uh, and, and housing. Uh, they consist of hamlets and villages, um, and they're typically not, uh, not serviced or they don't have full municipal services. So this is the rural, the rural settlement areas are an important component of the OP as well as the, the MCR. They're just not isolated in the uh, urban needs assessment because they fall out of that, that urban system according to the, the growth plan. Next slide. So when we're looking at the urban settlement area, in this case, looking at Paris, we're required to look at the growth and allocate that growth between two primary uh, categories, one being what, what the growth plan calls community areas, which is identified in the, the yellow here. And these are generally areas where people live as well as where we have uh, retail and other population related employment like schools, for example, and um, ser you know, service sector type, type employment. 
And the other category is identified in blue, which are employment areas, in this case, urban employment areas inside the Paris settlement area. And these are defined by the province's clusters of uh, business and economic activity, typically um, oriented towards industrial sectors like manufacturing, warehousing, but they would also include associated uh, office and employment supportive uses. It could include some ancillary retail uses or other um, non-industrial uses that would be supportive of the overall function of the uh, urban employment area. Next slide. So just to provide a bit more details on the employment types within these policy areas, we really have three types of employment. We have employment in community areas, which is typically your population related employment. So that's your retail, accommodation, food, institutional employment that's in included in these employment areas. Uh, you have urban employment areas. Um, so these are typically fully serviced industrial business parks and industrial areas. And then we have in the rural area, we have rural employment areas that are lands that are designated for industrial development, typically on dry in, in, in dry industrial areas um, outside of settlement area, urban settlement areas. And then we have the remaining uh, rural areas as well, where primarily most of the uh, agricultural activities would be taking place as well as other related um, rural employment growth. So I wanted to move into a bit of a discussion about the, the, the and then in the next slide um, on the um, provincial context uh, for growth and that, that regional context that, uh, that Jennifer uh, mentioned earlier. So if you go to the next slide, I wanted to start off by just, just providing a bit of background in terms of how the population is growing within the Greater Golden Horseshoe and um, some of these key trends and then we'll talk about employment. So the first thing I wanted to just uh, identify is that the, the GGH is experiencing significant population growth and is expected to grow uh, at, a, at a very rapid rate over the next uh, 30 years. Um, the overall rate of growth, uh, it's about 1.3% uh, 1 .3 a year. By the time we get to 2051, this entire area is expected to reach a population of about 15 million people. That's, that's an increase of about 155,000 people every year from 2016 to 2051. So when you put that into context, it's like adding the city of Guelph into the GGH every year on an annual basis for the next 35 years. The, um, the even more um, sort of pronounced uh, trend that we're seeing in the GGH is this outward growth pressure that we're seeing from the the center and the, the GTHA to the outer ring in that area in purple. And so when we look at how growth has been occurring historically, the GTHA was the primary growth driver, was growing faster, but over time that growth share is shifting. As you can see in the uh, the bar chart uh, to the left in, um, in blue and, and orange, that, that share of growth is shifting outward with more of the share occurring in the outer ring and growth occurring faster in that outer ring. And there's a number of things that are driving that. Um, one of the key factors that's driving that is uh, housing affordability. You can, um, you can get more for your money um, when you're buying a home outside of the outer ring. Um, there's also a growing employment market that uh, is also attracting uh, people into this area outside of the GTHA. There's also a number of other reasons, uh, the appeal for um, more urban and rural sort of balanced living, smaller, a smaller town you know, type living uh, environment. Um, slower pace of, of, of growth. Uh, these areas are also in the outer ring are also quite attractive to um, those in, their, in the 55 plus age group, for example. So all these factors are driving a, a growth rate that's much stronger now in the outer ring. And when you look at the rate of growth uh, in the table, the population uh, uh, rate annually is expected to just about double in the, um, in the outer ring over the next uh, 35 years. On the next slide, you can see a similar trend on employment. So when we look at the employment growth uh, for the entire GGH, we're looking at an increase uh, from about three, uh, sorry, 4.6 million to about 7 million people. That's, uh, sorry, jobs. That's, um, that's an increase of about 700,000 jobs annually that are uh, anticipated for uh, the entire GGH. And again, similar to the population, the that outward growth pressure is continuing to, um, to, to, to um, push more growth at a higher rate into the outer ring. 
Um, again, looking at the employment growth rate up on the table uh, at the top, you can see that the annual rate of employment growth is almost doubling again from 2001 to 16 to 2016 to 2051. So when we put this into context, um, we're located in the fastest growing city region in, in Ontario and the outer ring is now becoming the fastest area within that broader city region, uh, which is placing a lot of pressure for growth within Brant County. Uh, next slide. So when we look at the overall amount of growth um, that's being allocated to each of the municipalities and the rate, you can see that the county uh, of Brant is, is around midway in terms of its overall ranking in, in the outer ring. It's projected to grow at a rate of about 1.3%. Um, relative to historical trends, it's, that's quite a bit higher. Its historical growth rate over the last 15 years was about 0.9%. Um, so um, it's not the fastest growing area, but it is um, growing at a comparable rate to the GGH as a whole, outer ring as a whole. On the next slide, you'll see on, with respect to employment, the employment uh, growth in brand is expected to be relatively stronger. Historically, it's been growing at a rate of about 1%, you can see uh, with the orange dot. And then looking forward over the next 35 years, it's projected to increase significantly to about 1.6% annual and annual growth rate and ranking uh, closer to the top of the um, 15 outer ring upper tier and single tier municipalities. And there's a number of drivers for that, which I'm going to get into uh, as we move forward in the slide, uh, slide deck. Uh, next slide. So just putting this into a bit more context in terms of how is Brant uh, growing with, with respect to the overall growth and share within the outer ring. Historically, Brant County is made up of about two of 2% 2 of the overall population growth uh, relative to the outer ring, uh, GGH outer ring as a whole. And then going forward, is that overall share of growth is expected to remain at around 2%. When we look at employment, however, the overall share of growth has been lower at about 1%, but it's projected to double to about 2% over, over time. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to provide a little bit of background in terms of residential and non-residential growth trends before we get into uh, a more deeper dive on the, the forecast. So the first uh, slide I wanted to summarize is, on the next slide, is the uh, amount of building permit activity that's been taking place within uh, the County of Brant over the last uh, two decades or so, or uh, just over the last uh, decade. Um, between that time, um, we've, We've been, we were averaging in the early period around uh, 100, under 150 new building permits a year. But over the last five years, um, that, that share of growth is, uh, or that amount of growth is uh, more than doubled to over 300 uh, new building permits uh, issued a year uh, within the, uh, the county as a whole. And you can see in 2020, we had a, a big year uh, with over uh, 700 building permits issued. Um, and that's uh, an estimate of uh, total total permits uh, in, for 2020. Uh, there's, there's a number of factors that are driving that. The major factor that I, that I mentioned earlier is this outward growth pressure that, that I spoke of. COVID is also having an upward impact from what we can see on building permit activity in most of the outer ring municipalities that we're, we're working in and, and observing, and also areas beyond uh, the outer ring in southwestern Ontario. When we look at... Um, how COVID has been impacting uh, growth within the, uh, the province. We, we're, we're experiencing uh, more constraints in areas that are more heavily impacted by international migration in the large urban centers like Toronto and Peel and York. But as we get into uh, areas that are more impacted by um, local migration from uh, elsewhere in the province um, and elsewhere in the country, we're seeing uh, spikes pretty much all over in terms of uh, annual um, uh, activity this year in building permits. Next slide. We also took a look at the development pipeline. So this is a summary of active development applications that are um, in the pipeline that um, are either um, registered and unbuilt or draft approved or being proposed. So we've annualized this uh, amount of development activity. There's about 9,000 total units that are potentially identified uh, in, the, in the development pipeline uh, within the county uh, in total. Um, when we look at the um, potential uh, rate of approval of, uh, and, st and status of these development applications, 
we've generated a, a, a rough estimate of the total potential annual yield that could could, could be achieved um, from this uh, total development yield. And it averages about 450 total households per year um, over the next 20 years. So as, as Jennifer mentioned, it'll be really important for the county to develop phasing policies, particularly in its larger urban areas to manage this pace of growth over time. Um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a manner that's sustainable and supportable uh, for the for the county. I also wanted to also point out here that the uh, the share of developing the pipeline is uh, is also starting to broaden. You're seeing a, a wider variety of development applications in other forms of, of housing other than uh, low density forms. So you're seeing more townhomes and apartments, for example. Uh, next slide. So moving on to the employment base, just want to talk a little bit about the uh, the overall local economy. You can see from this um, uh, from this graph here that the the Brant County is highly concentrated in a number of um, what we would call export based or goods producing sectors as well as service sectors: manufacturing, construction, retail trade, healthcare and social assistance, transportation, and warehousing and wholesale trade. They comprise about 55% of the overall employment base within the county. Um, and you can see agriculture and forestry is also a large component of the, of the uh, county's economic base. And I, I'll speak to that in more detail as we, uh, as we go forward. Next slide. So this graph here is uh, a graph that shows, uh, it's called, these are called location quotients. And what this, this graph shows is the relative concentration of employment within Brent County relative to the provincial average. So, Sectors that have a concentration higher than 1% are considered to be more concentrated in Brant relative to the provincial average. And then in, in red, sectors that are um, have a concentration of less than one are um, identified to be less concentrated in Brant County relative to the provincial average. So you can see the agricultural uh, sector is highly concentrated in Brant County, as well as those, some of the other sectors that I mentioned in the previous slide. While these other sectors that are in red are not as highly concentrated, uh, uh, and, and this is a number of sectors that are primarily related to the service sector and the knowledge-based economy, it is important to recognize that these sectors are growing uh, and they're starting to see more growth in, uh, in recent years. Next slide. So you can see here in this slide that a number of these uh, existing uh, established clusters or sectors like con uh, construction, manufacturing, uh, wholesale trade and, and transportation, they're, they're all experiencing recent growth over the last three to four years, but we're also seeing growth in what we would call knowledge-based sectors like healthcare and social assistance, professional scientific services, uh, administration support, as well as sectors like arts, culture, and, and entertainment. So these sectors make up what we would typically call the creative you know, class economy in, in Brant. Next slide. So I wanted to spend a bit of time talking about the drivers of employment growth. Because given the amount of employment growth that's been identified in the growth plan, we want to really understand well, what is, what's driving this, this uh, increase in employment uh, over time. Next slide. So there are a number of key drivers of uh, employment growth within uh, the County of Brant. Um, I'll just briefly mention a few of them. Um, Clearly, access to the, uh, Highway 403 and other uh, access to other major regional infrastructure within about a one, one to slightly over one hour drive of uh, the county uh, is a key driver. Uh, ac access to the International Airport in uh, Pearson, the Hamilton Airport, uh, intermodal facilities within the West GTA, uh, as well as access to the U.S. border are all considered to be uh, key drivers of uh, export-based or industrial growth within um, within uh, the county of Brant. Um, there's also um, access to a large pool of skilled and unskilled labor within uh, about a one hour drive of uh, the county as well as um, locally, a locally growing labor force within Brant itself. Um, there's access to an, a myriad of post-secondary institutions within um, about a one hour drive radius, which is a, a key driver or draw for both businesses and, and residents uh, looking to locate in the area. The relative cost uh, competitive position of Brant County is also a key factor to mention, and I want to speak to that in a bit more detail in the next slide. So there's a couple of key um, factors here when it comes to cost competitiveness. Probably one of the major issues that I want to focus on tonight is just the overall cost of industrial land. 
And I also just want to focus on this issue of this outward growth pressure when, when it comes to employment land or industrial development. So when we look at how the GGH has, has been growing um, and, and how big of the uh, how big the industrial market is, the first thing to recognize is that the um, the, the GTA, uh, including Hamilton Industrial Base, is about the third largest in industrial inventory in all of North America. So it's a it's a massive industrial has a massive industrial inventory. Over half of that development has been occurring within the region of Peel over the last decade. But Peel's employment land supply is rapidly starting to diminish. It will be, it will be looking to expand into the northern areas of Peel uh, in Caledon over the next 35 years. But places like Mississauga and Brampton are approaching build out. And so as those areas build out, it's pushing more growth pressure to areas in the outer ring like Brent County for industrial development particularly in areas that have good access to 400 series highways like Brant and have a competitive position when it comes to land prices and um, uh, offer a expansion potential um, for more larger land expansive type uses. So Brant County really checks off all these boxes when we look at um, some of these, these requirements. And when we look at the price of land across uh, the, the, the surrounding market area, when we look at areas closer to the Pearson Airport, like the city of Brampton and Mississauga, um, prices are now approaching um, close to two million uh, per per service acre of land in in Brampton, and then go down from there. Brant County being at the lower end of this range at about one hundred and fourteen thousand dollars per uh, per service acre. So this does represent a fairly uh, key competitive uh, uh, feature for Brant County, providing that the lands are serviced. Um, and, uh, and available for development. Next slide. We, uh, through our work, we've, uh, we've built on the work that was uh, prepared under the uh, 2019 Economic Development Strategy. I took part in a number of those stakeholder sessions during that process. So we're building on the work of that uh, report. And when we look at what types of jobs we would expect to be uh, accommodating and wanting to attract in the employment land employment category or this industrial category, some of the key jobs uh, that I would uh, identify would be automotive, aerospace, biotechnology, uh, machine and metal fabrication industries. Again, these would be uh, sectors that would be particularly attracted uh, in fully service employment areas, which offer direct access to Highway 403. Next slide. As I mentioned, the uh, the economy is, uh, is 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 evolving and it's shifting within um, more broadly, globally, uh, nationally, provincially, and lo and 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 locally in Brant County. Uh, we have started to see um, a growing trend of job growth in knowledge-based sectors, and we we would continue to see um, more jobs uh, in these knowledge-based and technology-driven industries. What this means is that it, that Brant County will be required to think about how it's going to be planning for its employment areas to accommodate these types of jobs, and this requires a wider range of wide, wider range of amenities and some employment supportive uses that can accommodate both office and traditional industrial sectors that would be attracted to to uh, Brant County. Next slide. Also wanted to just mention the importance of the agricultural uh, sector and, and the rural economy. And I'm not going to read all these points, but just wanted to point out that um, Brant County is home to uh, approximately 700 farms over 165,000 acres of farmland. And um, that covers um, a, a, a wide range of both direct and indirect farm related activities. And so it's important to recognize that opportunities um, for for agriculture related and, and sort of agriculture related industrial and commercial uses which are permitted in agricultural areas need to be recognized in the official plan as we move forward next slide in terms of the overall supply of vacant shovel or sorry vacant employment lands within uh, the county uh, we, we have an overall uh, vacant supply right now of just under 300 net hectares, uh, but it's important to recognize that most of this land is not shovel ready. It's not ser fully serviced and available for development. So it's, in, it's very critical that uh, these lands are, are serviced and uh, provided for uh, near term development over the, uh, the next you know, five uh, or I would say two to five years to ensure that uh, the county uh, can capitalize on near term economic opportunities. So I wanna move into the forecast now, uh, building on some of that background. Next slide. 
Uh, next slide. So as Jennifer mentioned, we provided two uh, growth forecasts. One is uh, two scenarios. One is what we're calling the growth plan scenario. That is the scenario that's identified in schedule three of the growth plan. And then we also looked at a higher uh, growth scenario, building on some of the work that was prepared by the, the province in the summer in support of the growth plan update. So this first scenario identifies a uh, total population in 2051 of 59,000 people. That's an increase of about 21,000 people from 2016 to 51. It represents a, an increase of about 1.4% annually. And it's generally targeting uh, or tracking to the, uh, the, the, the county's current official plan by 2031 of 47,000. Next slide. So in scenario two, we looked at the higher growth scenario identified in the background work that was prepared by the, uh, for the growth plan. It identifies stronger growth in the, uh, the next uh, 10 years, growing to about 49,000 by 2031, then ultimately by, to, by 51 to 61,000. So it's identifying what a total of an additional 2,000 people over that time period. Generally, these two forecasts are fairly um, tight in terms of their range. They, they didn't look at a very broad range of population. We didn't see a need to look at um, a, a higher range of scenarios at this point. We thought these were uh, both um, appropriate uh, scenarios to start with. Uh, I just want to again reiterate that the growth plan scenario uh, is now um, de defined as the minimum amount of growth that you have to plan for. So there is really no option in accordance with the growth plan to, to, to look at a lower scenario than, than scenario one. Uh, next slide. So this slide here, um, Jennifer mentioned uh, some of the stats on um, vital statistics and fertility and things like this. Uh, we're not gonna get into all the details of this, but wanted to really just um, highlight um, what's driving population growth and what's driving population is my, net migration. It's not typically international migration that's driving population in Brant County, but rather in, intra-provincial migration. So it's uh, people coming to Brant County from other parts of the province, primarily the GTA and the West GTA. When we look at the amount of migration that's required to achieve this forecast, it's quite significant. It's over, uh, uh, almost double, I should say, the amount of historical migration that's required relative to the last 15 years, comparing that over the next uh, 35 years. One of the reasons why there's so much pressure on migration is because growth from natural increase, which is births less deaths, is, is um, negative and it's becoming more negative over time as the population ages. So it puts more reliance on migration. Next slide. So we also looked at the age structure and this, this graph is um, it's a little busy, but it's, uh, it's important to recognize um, age structure for a number of reasons. One, it helps identify uh, household formation patterns for uh, for the county, uh, but it's also important to recognize how this might influence um, municipal services and infrastructure. A couple of key things I wanted to point out here is to begin with is that the, the county's population is aging and it's that's not unique to the county. It's um, generally uh, a consistent theme that we see across all of Ontario and Canada. Um, but it is aging at a fairly steady rate and it's aging because of the large a bulge of baby boomers that we have uh, within the county. Um, as of 2021, the front wave of that, uh, that generation is going to turn 75 years of age. And so if you look at the top uh, bar chart here, um, the, the top um, gray bar, starting 2016, you can see that 75 plus age group was 8% of the population. By 2051, it's projected to grow to 18% of the overall population. So it's projected to the more than double in terms of its share. And so that has significant implications on um, the pace of growth, uh, as well as the types of housing that we provide, uh, requiring more options for a variety of, of high density housing, uh, affordable housing options and seniors housing. We also have a growing population um, in all the other age groups. While they're not increasing necessarily in proportion, there we're growing and so we need to provide a broad range of housing options for all other uh, age groups and incomes as well. Um, I mentioned um, also services and, uh, um, and infrastructure. So another factor that is important to recognize when we're, um, when we're looking at uh, the MCR and the official plan. Next slide. 
This, uh, this slide here provides a summary of the housing required to accommodate the, the, the uh, scenario one forecast, the preferred forecast. Overall, we're projecting the household uh, numbers to increase by just under 9,000 total units from 2016 to 51, uh, um, with a total of 22,000 22, units by 2051. Next slide. When we look at the overall amount of growth um, going forward relative to historical trends, that's a significant amount of annual activity, represents about 250 uh, units a year, relative to about 110 that you've been achieving um, between 2006 and 2016. You can also see that the share of growth by type is shifting. So we're expecting to see a greater share of housing within that high density category over time. Uh, again, driven by some of those uh, demographic um, and affordability issues that I raised uh, earlier uh, in the previous slide. Next slide. So moving on to employment, again, similar to the, the population forecast, we prepared two overall scenarios. The first scenario being the um, scenario one growth plan scenario. Under this scenario, again, the employment base is expected to grow uh, on track to achieve the 2031 official plan target of 19,000 jobs by 2031 and ultimately reach 26,000 jobs by 2051. Next slide. Under the high scenario, we'd expect the growth to be uh, growing at a faster rate, reaching a higher population, sorry, a higher employment uh, base of 22,000 by 2031 and then 29,000 by 2051. Under this scenario, the employment base would grow by about 14,000 jobs uh, over the, uh, the long-term uh, planning horizon. Next slide. So, this slide here provides a bit more details on the types of jobs by uh, type. So the, the, um, the growth plan doesn't really speak to sectors as much as it does employment types. And so employment types are important for planners because it's uh, more uh, focused on where growth is going to be, employment growth is going to be located on, uh, in geographic areas as opposed to sectors. So we looked at both. We're looking at sectors and employment types. Uh, when we look at uh, the overall uh, amount of growth by type, we can see that employment lands employment, which is again, largely your industrial-based employment, uh, its share of, of uh, employment is expected to remain relatively steady at about 49%. Uh, Population-related employment is expected to increase in share from about 33% to 38%. And the rural employment base, while it's growing, is expected to lose a bit of share from 18% to 13% just because the urban growth is growing so, so quickly. The other thing that I wanted to point out is the, uh, the red line here, which is the employment activity rate. And that is just a, a way to um, define the, the ratio of jobs to population. So we're looking at the total amount of jobs in, uh, in the county of Brant divided by the total population, regardless of the population age, just the total, the total population. And what this shows is the activity rate is increasing over time from about 39% to 44%. What that means is that the employment base is growing faster than the population to ultimately achieve a, a higher activity rate. This is a very desirable outcome for um, municipalities to achieve a higher activity rate um, and uh, ultimately uh, be providing more of a balanced approach to uh, population and employment. Next slide. So we wanted to provide a little bit of details now on some of the preliminary findings with respect to the allocation of growth by um, by urban and rural area. Next slide. This first uh, slide here provides a summary of the annual activity of growth in Paris and St. George and the other remaining rural uh, settlement areas and remaining rural area. Over the forecast period, we expect to see the amount of annual activity of housing more than double in Paris from about 80 units a year to 165. In St. George, that annual amount of activity is expected to uh, quadruple uh, on average annually. On the, uh, in contrast, we see a, a declining share of, of activity and uh, a slower rate of growth in the rural area over time as more growth is concentrated to fully serviced uh, urban areas, um, the, the two fully serviced urban areas of, of Brant County. Next slide. So what this means is that the county's population is growing, but it's also urbanizing uh, and it's becoming more urban. 
over the um, the 2016 to 51 period, about 89% of development activity for residential development will occur within the urban area, or is expected to occur in the urban area, with 11% occurring in the rural area. Next slide. So this just gives you a bit of an idea of how the growth rate varies between urban areas and rural areas. So the overall growth rate I mentioned is about 1.3%. When we look at Paris, it's projected to grow at a rate of about 2.1%. While St. George well, it's not seeing as much absolute growth is growing at a faster rate at 3.0% uh, over time. And uh, lastly, the remaining rural area is growing at a more modest rate of 0.2% over time. Next slide. So we have a few additional slides on the employment applications. Uh, we'll start on the next slide with um, a breakdown of the rural employment growth. Next slide. So in the rural employment, uh, with respect to rural employment, the overall um, annual amount of rural activity is highly concentrated within uh, the Paris settlement area. So this is this is both a factor of um, high population growth in Paris, which is driving the need for population-related uh, employment, as well as the opportunities for uh, urban employment growth within Paris. Uh, and then St. George uh, is anticipated to see about 50 uh, employees per year, and the remaining rural area about 35 employees per year. Next slide. So when we look at the overall rate of growth between the urban and rural area, we can see uh, for employment, again, higher rates of employment within the urban area and a relatively more modest rate of employment growth in the, in the rural area. Next slide. And so I wanted to provide uh, a brief um, set of recommendations following this presentation tonight. Uh, on the next slide, um, We've identified that in accordance with our review of the recent development trends and anticipated growth drivers, the scenario one forecast, the growth plan scenario reflects the most likely population employment forecast over the long term planning horizon. And it's recommended that this that the county proceed with scenario one, the growth plan scenario for the purposes of the new official plan. And we feel this scenario is, a, is the most appropriate because one, it represents a reasonable increase in long term population employment growth relative to historical trends. Two, it accurately anticipates and reflects these anticipated regional uh, and local growth drivers that I identified within the broader market area. And three, it, it also represents a steady increase in the overall share of annual net migration, housing and employment growth to the county relative to the surrounding market area over the long term. Next slide. And for the next slide, I uh, wanted to talk about next steps. Uh, so there's a number of um, additional technical steps that need to be uh, undertaken. Uh, Jennifer mentioned these uh, at the beginning of the presentation. We're, in, we're still in the relatively early stages of the technical analysis, uh, but an important stage looking at the overall amount of growth and the allocations of growth. Our next, um, our next meeting would be in February to look at the urban structure in more detail and provide a more detailed analysis of community land needs, uh, as well as intensification potential across the county. And then in March, we would come back and speak more specifically to the employment land needs analysis and the employment strategy with the anticipation of drafting a report, uh, an MCR report uh, in April of 2021, uh, followed by a council meeting and a final report in May of 2021. That concludes my presentation and happy to take some questions uh, at this time. Well, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Scary things are happening to St. George, I think. Maybe it gives me a little time to get the place in shape to sell it. <laughs> anyway, um, are there any questions for the presenter? Councillor Bell, you're first, followed by Councillor Ferrier. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a lot of questions and I realize that other people have a lot of questions. So I'll try and ask a few uh, and let other people take over. Um, as a bit of background, I think what I have uh, I've picked up are, con are concerns from our community about three or four things. One is the absolute level of growth. How big can we grow? How big should we grow? And why do we have to grow as big as we do? Uh, I think close behind that is the pace of growth. You know, why do we have to grow at the pace we are growing? Because if you look at one of the slides that Jane showed, we've, we've uh, given 757 building permits this year. 
uh, which is three times the average that you quoted in one of your other slides. Now, if every year is 757, my God, this is gonna be difficult to manage. Um, I think uh, being very parochial, there is a, an obvious focus on Paris. It, it is the growth center of residential for the next 10 years. It's the growth center for employment for the whole period. And I think that has a knock on effect to, you know, can people that are here already continue to live here? Can they, can they afford to move from their current house to a new house when they get to the point of retirement? It, it's a concern about affordability. I think there's a broad uh, desire to keep industry away from residential, but that maybe is another step down the, the, the chain. So I think uh, questions I have are around what flexibility do we have to set the pace of growth, the, the absolute levels of growth, where we grow, uh, and what degrees of freedom do we have to, to work to uh, manipulate that? And, and a, a very specific question, who, who or what sets the allocations? Um, and I'm particularly interested in how we've decided how much to allocate to Paris, how much to St. George, and how much to the rural area. And in, in, that, in that context, the, the uh, split of those three elements, it, it seems a very simple split, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, but I think that we're missing the opportunity of recognizing places like Burford and Canesville which is essentially secondary urban settlement areas uh, to take a bigger proportion of the uh, anticipated growth. I, I think I'll, I'll ask one more question and pass it on, but to be very clear, we have no choice, and this is for the viewers tonight and for our residents, we have no choice but to target 2051 at 59,000. That's the minimum number we can go for. Jamie, you could answer that? That is correct. Uh, that, that is the minimum forecast that the province uh, has set out in Schedule 3 of the, of the 2019 growth plan. Good. So we've no point in talking about making it lower, but we can adjust the pace with which we get there. That is correct. So the numbers that you've shown on that graph, which looks like a straight line from 2021 to 2051, that's just one way of showing it. Because my understanding from the numbers you've given uh, the forecast we have already of current uh, population and already approved uh, housing would take us to 49,000 by 2031. So we're actually above that curve. So a question that I would ask as a resident is, why are we going so fast? So I, I'm going to leave that there and that, let other people take over. I do have more questions, Mr. Mayor, but I let other people take over. Thank you. Councillor the Ferrier, your next Councillor Pierceer. After that, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Cook. Um, I just want to get it clear, and, and some of this is going to sound a little bit like what Councillor Bell said, but maybe with a, a little more uh, uh, <laughs> frustration. But so, so the province is allowing us the choice of fifty-nine thousand or sixty-one thousand people in the county by twenty fifty-one. So that's our big local choice as dictated by the province. 2,000 people, one way or the other, that's the local choice. And, and with all due respect, what a disappointing joke of choice. This is the top issue in our community by a long shot. Uh, and this is what we get from the province in terms of that local choice. Is that correct? Um, just to be clear, the, the, what the province is identifying is um, a minimum target of, um, in scenario one um, by 2051. That's, um, that is the overall um, forecast that we're, we're planning to of 59,000. You're not gonna like the answer to this, but the province does allow you to go higher. You can go higher than 61,000, you just can't go right. low. So they've kind of flipped it around. It, the forecast used to be the, the, the ceiling, now it's the floor. Gotcha, so, so thank you for that. And again, I know this, you're just the bearer of bad news, um, but uh, anger's gotta go somewhere. Uh, is there any scenario for you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Jamie, uh, where the province lowers the total amount of mandated growth to our county and specifically to Paris? There's no option that's set out in the growth plan at this time to uh, apply for alternative, uh, an alternative forecast. So the, the province allows for alternatives when it comes to intensification. Um, it allows for flexibility with respect to density, but it doesn't prescribe a alternative for a lower amount of growth. But, but to 
Councillor Bell's earlier comment, it does allow you to manage that growth over that, uh, that long-term planning horizon and phase and pace that, that development in a way that's uh, appropriate in, uh, in your local circumstances. And one more question, Mr. Mayor, through you. While, while the province is saying that this is the floor, that 59,000 is the floor by 2051, do they provide any guidance or help to us? I know we have some options in terms of trying to get types of housing and you know whether it's affordable, et cetera. But you know, if they're mandating that this growth has to happen, I know some jurisdictions, not Ontario, but some jurisdictions also mandate that X percentage have to be affordable housing, X percentage have to be public housing, X percentage have to be this type or that type. It sounds to me as though the province is saying, here's your floor, this is the minimum, which is huge, but this is the minimum, but they don't make the development folks, the developers, I should say, have to create the actual mix of housing in a way that might be beneficial to the entire province. So, so we're still gonna have an affordable housing crisis because those numbers aren't baked into the formula, are they? There's, you know, there's lots of challenges associated with accommodating the housing. Um, the provincial policy statement does provide further direction in terms of uh, provisions for affordable housing. Uh, and there's also uh, requirements of both the PPS and the growth plan with respect to intensification uh, there's mention in both the, again both those provincial documents in terms of uh, housing mix by by structure type um, by, by by structure type but not by by type of like around affordability let's say like there, there's, there's nowhere that they say 17 percent have to be public housing or affordable housing and here's incentives to do so the the, the PPS requires you to, to establish an affordable housing target but it doesn't um, it doesn't provide prescriptive um, measures in terms of uh, implementation tools or incentives uh, that I'm aware of. You, that's, okay, thank that's, you. that's something you that's in your right to look at though. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pierce, then Councillor Howes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. And uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of numbers in there that we've had, uh, you know, uh, um, a lot of people are, are very upset at. A couple of things that, that I, I would like to clarify here, and uh, the the previous councillors kind of hit on a couple of them, but just to reiterate, um, the province is mandating us a number of to grow, but they're not mandating what types of houses to build, aka affordable. Again, that's that's very disappointing uh, on 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 both sides of that. What I want to understand here is we've got scenario one and scenario two. Are they are, are both of these scenarios um, given to us by the province? The first scenario, scenario one, has been given to you by the province, and it's an it's an the official forecast in Schedule Three of the growth plan. Right. The other scenario was a uh, prior to the growth plan being updated, um, they um, they conducted a a background analysis to look at various ranges of growth for each of the upper tier and um, single tier municipalities across the GGH. And they provided a low, medium, and high. They picked the medium forecast. Uh, what I have shown you is the medium and the high scenario for Brant County in that background work. We okay. didn't see the need to create another another scenario on top of that, so we went with the the growth plan and then the med uh, sorry and then the high scenario as being the two options to work with. Okay, so is it possible to do, um, if if you want to call it a combination platter? Obviously, we can't do anything about the numbers of population in scenario one that we've been mandated by, but is it possible that we could use scenario two numbers for employment because they're higher on that end, or does it have to be all scenario one or all scenario two? There's nothing that would prohibit you from going to a higher employment forecast and sticking with the growth plan forecast, um, as you mentioned. So that's something you could explore. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, uh, as I say, the previous councillors kind of hit on my other questions, and I appreciate that. So we'll just, uh, we'll leave it to some others to see what else comes up here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Housen and Councillor Gatward. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to to our presenter and and to uh, Jennifer, who who provided the introduction at the beginning. Um, yeah, the, these are, these are, these numbers are a tough pill to swallow. Um, Appreciate. I, I really appreciate. In Jennifer's introduction, she she clearly mentioned that that 
due to feedback from the community and, and from council that staff had revised our approach to, to growth to, to this, uh, to a slower and more managed uh, growth approach. Um, thank goodness for that, because anything worse than this would be really hard to, to accept. Um, my, I guess one of my questions is, uh, and I, it's, it's unfortunate we don't have all of the non-Paris counselors here tonight because I, I, this is a, this is a countywide uh, shift in numbers. If I, if I look at the, the, the numbers as presented, and if I understand this correctly, today, the population of, of, of our county is somewhere between 40 and 41,000 um, people. And Paris represents 35% of that. St. George represents 9% of it. And the rest of, of the county of Brant that is, is 56, more than half of, of our population. Um, what I'm seeing from the growth projections is that of this, this increase of 18 to 19,000 people over 30 years, Paris is, in, is intended to receive 68% of that growth. St. George is intended to receive 24% of the growth and, and the other rural areas 9%. To me, that's, that clearly shows a significant shift within our county um, to the point where Paris will represent more than 50% of, of the population of the County of Brant, which, which is significantly a significant change. I just wanted to say, do I understand that correctly? And I don't know whether it's our, our guest who can best answer that or whether it's Jennifer. I, I can start with that answer. Yes, uh, Councillor Howes, you've, uh, you have interpreted that correctly. That is, um, that is the forecast that we've laid out uh, for you in, um, in scenario one. Um, it's important to recognize that unlike the overall minimum that we've been talking about where you don't have a, an option to go lower, you do have options with respect to how growth is allocated. Um, so to just provide you a little bit of background, the, the allocations are really driven by two, well, three, three main factors. One is um, anticipated market activity where we were expecting to see growth in between urban and rural. The second is we have, a, we have provincial uh, documents, primarily the, the PPS and the growth plan that generally direct uh, growth on full, uh, in urban areas on full services. Um, so it's another factor that's driving uh, growth, and I guess that's really the, the second two, two and three that I wanted to mention. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't take a look at the allocations, and if if we feel that we need to uh, to shift these allocations and we want to be a little bit more balanced um, between urban and rural, there's nothing preventing us from doing that. Just recognizing that um, when we're looking at larger scale development outside of the urban areas of St. George and Paris that don't have full municipal services, then that can require um, more discussion about how that kind of growth would be accommodated. So, um, so mo moderate, moderate changes or minor changes to that allocation would be fairly um, straightforward. More significant changes, because of the magnitude of growth, more significant changes to that share would be uh, something that would have to be looked at. All right, thank you. And Mr. Mayor, one last comment, if you don't mind, through you. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I would just, I guess my last comment on this right now is, is it's, it's very clear that we can't negotiate a lower growth number, but, and, and I'm, I guess I'm directing this more to, to our staff and Jennifer in particular, as we move ahead with our official plan, I think it's, I, I, I it's going to be critical that we, we, we put some specifics in our official plan about the pace at which we grow and the, the, style, of, the style of dwellings that, that we build into the mix. I, you know, if, if we can't change that 59,000 number 30, for 30 years from now, let's at least put our best foot forward to, to, to try to, to manage the pace. We know that demand for housing here is going to be high. 
um, we are the only opportunity to control the pace of, of how, how fast these dwellings get built and what type of dwellings they are. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gatwer, you're next, please. And then Councillor Miller. Thank you, Ms. Mayor Bailey. Um, well, this isn't much of a surprise. I've been through this exercise before. And um, when you consider that we have 41,000 people in Brant County, um, going to 59,000 in the next 30 years is only an increase of 18,000 people. So if you divide 18,000 people by 30 years, it's what, 6,000 people per year? Um, or 600. It, it's, it doesn't sound so bad if you figure it out like that. <laughs> I, I, um, I know that the parish councillors think that all the growth is in their urban areas, but in the last month, they've started two subdivisions in Ward 5. Those subdivisions naturally aren't as large as what is being built where there's full servicing because the province won't allow that kind of growth in rural areas. And we are restricted by the city of Brantford in the Mount Pleasant area. I wanna remind council about that because they have not brought their water servicing to the boundary adjustment area of Tootla Heights. Uh, there are lots available to be developed in Mount Pleasant and Mount Pleasant has municipal water. However, there's a hold because the water system's at its full capacity. So until the city builds the water to Tootla Heights, that allocation can't be brought back to the county and have more subdivisions. There's two that I know of in Mount Pleasant, but they can't have anything happen because of the water restrictions. So the rural areas are growing. In our first official plan way back when, there was a lot of estate residential lots allocated in the county. And not all of those have been built out, but um, they have been building slowly. It's not always a good thing because it aggravates the farmers if the city folk come out and build these big beautiful houses and then they don't like the dust or the noise or the smells. But as you saw in the statistics, Brant has a large rural area, over 160,000 acres of farmland. And I don't know that we want to grow houses on a lot of those um, farms. Some farmers may look at it as their retirement fund. But within our settlement boundaries, and Jennifer, I believe, is going to be reviewing all the areas in the county, the settlement, rural settlement boundaries, to see where there may be room for growth. Scotland was pictured earlier in one of the slides, and I know that at the corner of Oakland Road and Highway 24, there is land that's designated in the official plan as suburban residential. Now that farm has been for sale for I don't know how many years and nobody is buying it. So maybe developers don't want to develop 
in rural areas, or maybe they don't like that it's next to Highway 24. I don't know what the issue is there, but I think the for sale sign might be down now. Maybe it'll go back up in the spring. I don't know, but it seems that people want servicing. They want to be able to turn on the tap and not worry about whether their well is polluted or their pump is working to ensure that they're going to be able to fill their pot with water to cook dinner. So it's a whole different lifestyle in the rural areas. And um, as James mentioned, there's a lot of interprovincial migration and the type of people that are migrating from the larger cities, they expect to be able to turn on the tap and not worry about a thing. So I can't see that um, pushing growth into rural areas where we're trying to preserve farmland is necessarily a good thing. Um, everyone knows we've talked about servicing in Burford and that may come in the next 10 years, who knows? Um, but those are my comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Gatwood. Councillor Miller, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one comment, two questions. Um, yes, sir. As far as the vast majority of Burford residents go, I can tell you after our last planning session, they welcome growth as much as people in the town of Paris do. They don't. <laughs> Outside of a few businesses, the vast majority are were, were really upset. So just letting you know, because um, I heard it. Um, I got a question. I don't know if it goes to Jennifer or to Mr. Cook. Um, in Jennifer, your report, you talk about a 15% intensification target. A couple questions on that. Where did that 15% go or come from? Sorry. And, and I noticed in Mr. Cook's presentation, I think you talked about, or maybe it's Jennifer's report, talked about it going into already built up areas. So how do you get it into the built up areas? Is that through the ARUs, additional residential units and infilling, or is there another way where a house comes down and maybe a duplex goes up or something like that? So, so on that topic, where did the 15% come from and how do you get there in the built up areas? That's my first question. Jennifer? All right, thank you through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Miller. I'll do my best to uh, answer this question, then also have Jamie jump in as well after me. Um, right. The 15 percent uh, <coughs> intensification is actually a target in the growth plan, and that's the County of Brant's target um, for the outer ring. Um, so we have two different targets. So there's forecasts and then there's targets. So we have two targets. One is the 15 percent intensification uh, minimum in the built up area. And then we also have a different target, which is the uh, 40 people and jobs per hectare for designated greenfield areas for new developments. So it's a density calculation. So that's actually for the outer ring. So all the different uh, Greater Golden Horseshoe municipalities all have different targets. Like for instance, uh, Region of Waterloo's got a very high target um, just because they have more urban areas. Um, they're looking at like a 60% uh, intensification. The county intensification uh, target has been really quite low. Um, and we'll hear more about that with our land needs assessment. Um, and it's the fact that uh, it's really a minimum, but I'll get Jamie to talk about that. And the county's looking at um, a higher one. And we've also heard from the development industry. So in terms of that in the built up area, it's all it's different things like what you said. Um, it's uh, providing like a uh, you know, tearing down a, a, a single and doing like a triplex. Um, it's creating more units is what it's doing already in built up areas. So it's actually um, uh, capitalizing on opportunities for uh, more in different types of housing uh, units that we could provide already in built up areas. So what it's trying to do is to tell municipalities that you've got different options instead of building just single detached homes. 
Um, it, it allows for uh, the provision of different types of housing. Um, but I'll get Jamie to jump in uh, with some additional details about what it means for the county. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Jennifer. Um, just to build on that, so um, li like Jennifer noted, uh, the 15% target is um, it's what's currently in your official plan now. You have to achieve at least what you've already established as a policy for intensification in accordance with the growth plan policy. Um, so we're looking at the opportunities for intensification through both the supply and demand lens, ultimately to provide a balanced uh, revised target. And so we've been working with the county to um, explore uh, opportunities for um, so supply opportunities, like Jennifer mentioned, that could be infill, re uh, long-term redevelopment. There's still uh, some subdivisions that were captured within that built-up area that are not really true intensification, but they they're still within the built-up area of Paris and St. George, which which count. Uh, there's not many of those left. Going forward, um, we'll be providing a, a recommended target, whether that's still 15% or whether we want to go a little bit higher is something that we can we can have further discussion on. Um, we're not, um, I don't think we're uh, making a statement tonight about that that target. I think we'll wait until we uh, finish the urban land needs assessment to come back to you uh, with a recommended target. Thank you. Councilor Miller, you okay, have a second yeah, okay, question. So that I do, yes, but that 15% is not written in stone. So, okay, I appreciate that. It's not written and, in and stone. And I do know. Yeah. Sorry. You just, you, I was just going to say, you, later, just, you just can't go lower than that number. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, I've heard that a few times tonight about yeah. other things. Um, yeah. Are you familiar, Mr. Cook, with the term ceteris paribus? Uh, no, I don't think I am. Really? All else being equal, well, I'm surprised. Um, I, th I think that could have been this. Well, they, they teach in university. It should be, um, it could be a subtitle to your report, you know, all else being equal, because I guess, I guess you, you show a plan and it's quite far into the future. And, and as you know, predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future. But I guess what you're looking at is the probability that, you know, this is the way things go. And, and the only reason I'm bringing that up tonight um, is because COVID's been mentioned once as a disruptor, right? And I look at the, some of the jobs you're talking about coming here. And I'm just wondering, um, the jobs that you're looking at, when, when, were those, when were those listed? In other words, was COVID taken into consideration? Now, I'll give you an example. I've got a, a, two relatives of mine, um, husband, wife. They're both in IT, both make good money, they both work downtown Toronto, and neither of them's gotten into work for months. And it looks like they probably won't have to go into work, you know, but, you know, once uh, once every six months or something from here on in, that's what it's looking like. So I see those people um, of that sort kind of, you know, now now you're not so tied to the GTA. So, so how much of an impact will that, do you think, have on, those types of jobs that you see coming to the county, if if at all, or maybe you've already taken them into consideration. That's, yeah, that's my question in a roundabout way. It's it's a great question, uh, Councillor Miller, and it's it's probably the hottest topic, you know, um, for very obvious reasons right now, across uh, across the province and the world, I suppose. And so, a question I get asked a lot. And to be honest, you know, I'm still trying to navigate through it, just like everybody else. But I would say that you know what we're there's a couple of things I would know. One is that we're we're definitely uh, starting to see um, the impacts of COVID. You know, we're recovering from the 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 the, 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 um, the peak of you know unemployment that we saw in the summer, and we're gradually recovering. But we're seeing, you know, we're seeing accelerations in disruption that was already taking place prior to the to the the pandemic, and that's just accelerating forward with respect to technology driven technology uh sorry technology driven uh disruption in the economy and the nature of work um and we're also seeing um uh, right now continued outward growth pressure and accelerated outward growth pressure on the residential side because of this um greater opportunity for remote work and um and technology enabling that uh, to go um you know further and, and and provide more opportunity over the over the near term i, I don't think we're going to see the world completely go back to the way it was after uh, this pandemic is over. Um, but I, I think it's important to recognize that um, 
I don't also see we're going to see, I don't see like we're going to have negative impacts uh, economically over the long term as a result of COVID. We're going to, but we're going to continue to have disruption. So right now there's questions in my mind about, you know, the demand for office. Uh, that seems to be um, a, a key one that we're still trying to grapple with is, you know, is the office sector, real estate sector going to rebound? Um, and it's, it's, it's quite unclear right now, but I, what I can tell you is that there's going to be, I think, winners and losers that are going to come from COVID, and we're going to see a lot of opportunity in technology-driven sectors. Um, and we're also going to see, uh, I, I don't think we're going to see a lot of negative impacts on the need for, for uh, industrial space and, and land expansive uses. You know, e-commerce isn't going anywhere. It's only going to be more impacted by, uh, it was only being more impacted by COVID and will continue to, I think, move in that direction. That's going to put more demand on large scale uh, space to accommodate logistics and fulfillment uh, uh, operations. Um, so it, it won't have a, I don't think it'll have a negative impact on how much land we're going to need to uh, be planning for uh, when it comes to planning for our industrial areas. So I see shifts. Um, I don't see, uh, I don't see a negative uh, outcome with this, providing that municipalities are being proactive in terms of how they're planning for disruption and, and, and change. Uh, and I, I, uh, over the long term, I think we're going to continue to see this outward growth pressure continue. And the province, uh, strangely enough, also has another set of projections that it that it works with under the Ministry of Finance. And those projections also show even more pronounced shifts outside of the GTHA in the um, in the outer ring. And those projections were updated during the summer of this year, and they're continually showing more and more of this outward growth pressure. Uh, and it's starting to show up in places I'm working outside of the GGH in, you know, in Perth and Huron and Gray and Bruce and all the way down into, um, well, not all the way down, but, you know, as we get further down into like Oxford and Middlesex. Uh, so um, that's, uh, that's what I can provide you at this point, uh, Councillor Miller. Okay, I appreciate the answer. Sounds like we should probably uh, lock up that 59,000 number as quick as we can, because I think <laughs> there's only one way it's going and that's up. So, okay, thank you very much. Sir. Any other questions? Councillor Bell, you're next. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Matt. Again, through you to uh, Jamie. Um, to get more specific, uh, you've actually written in your report, we can choose where, and I, I, I paraphrase, growth will go, how it should look, and how long it will take. Can you tell me what the tools are to do that? Because you've given us the start point and the end point, and you've told us that anywhere in the middle we can go as flexible as we want. How do we square that off with, in Paris, having already got, I would say, probably three to 4,000 new homes already approved, ready to go? It's a, a, another great question, uh, Councillor Bell. I'm wondering maybe if I should direct this question first to, to planning um, and then maybe um, weigh in. I just don't want to um, speak out of turn in terms of some of the tools or approaches that planning may be looking at right now. Uh, I, we mentioned uh, the need for phasing policies. Uh, that's clearly, I think, an important uh, tool. Um, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to, if you don't mind, I'm going to turn it over to planning to, uh, to address this question, uh, at least initially. All right, thanks, Jamie. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bell. So the biggest thing is, is what you've seen tonight in terms of the actual uh, forecasting and the numbers is um, what's in the pipeline in terms of housing units. And you know, and from a lot of the numbers you've seen tonight is we have an unbelievable amount already, um, either in some sort of stage of appeal or draft approved already uh, to 2031. Um, so part of this is what we're doing is we're coming up with a comprehensive growth management strategy, and that's actually a document at the end of the official plan process, and including that is a phasing of development plan, and it's also the allocation of where growth will happen. So the county's actually never had that before, um, which has been one of the issue of what you've seen today. Um, we don't have that um, with our municipal comprehensive review, which was 2008 to 2012. So, and uh, one big issue, as you know, is the amount of appeals we had on subdivisions through uh, OMB or LPAT as it's called now. And it sort of stranglehold the, the county in a certain way in terms of when the units were approved and the amount of building permits. 
So the reason of what you've seen uh, this year in terms of over 700 building permits was the result of LPAD appeals being approved and worked through the process. Um, but without a proper phasing of development plan, uh, the county had to entertain in terms of certain stages of, of subdivision to get them registered. So in key, the essence is the control of the county. So the number one thing is our new official plan, which if we get it done by the time frame, which you know I'm adamant about, is the fact that it's not appealable. Number one, hands down, not appealable. Um, it puts us in a great position. And then if we get a proper growth management strategy, to phase it out um, in terms of a way that satisfies not only that with servicing. Um, the biggest talk here tonight is about the allocations of growth, um, but it also does have to do with a lot of things that are actually in the pipeline in terms of master servicing plans and our transportation master plan. So we're working hand in hand to figure those things out, right? For Burford, for Keynesville, uh, what's come with Paris and also St. George. And also in terms of, um, good planning principle um, in terms of if we do want to have uh, smaller developments and smaller expansions to say Oak Hill or airport area on private servicing, is that good planning principle? So, but I guess the key point is, is for Councillor Bell's question is, is really about the phase out of development. And the key is, is, is you can't, you can't entertain uh, expansion rapid growth without the proper servicing. Um, you heard Paris Master Servicing Plan a few weeks ago at Council. Uh, you saw the chart uh, in terms of how much capacity we have. Uh, you have to have capacity in housing for three years at a time minimum. Um, that's going to be worked into our phasing in as well. So I don't know if Jamie wants to add anything out to that, but those three key pieces as part of our new OP, uh, non-appealable is, is really what we're striving for. And it puts the county in the driver's seat as, as well. So. I think, uh, Jennifer, I think you covered off the main points um, better than I could have done really. But um, I would maybe just, uh, the, uh, the other side of this is um, making sure you don't constrain growth either, I guess. And I, that might not be a, a key topic of, uh, what we're, we're speaking about tonight on residential but when it comes to non-residential it's a, it's a key issue so it, you also have control in terms of uh, accommodating uh, industrial and, and non-residential development and so on the other hand you need to make sure you're providing an act, a, adequate supply of serviced uh, employment land or industrial lands primarily in um, areas that are going to be highly marketable um, and accessible to the 403 and and there's other locations as well um, but that, uh, that's a key challenge on the other side when it comes to controlling and managing uh, the pace of growth. Thank you. So with, within that uh, answer, can we look to the OP uh, as well as getting in on, on time to give us a defense against future appeals? Can we look to changing designations of lands that are in the current uh, uh, official plan so that we can designate some of the land along the 403 to be employment and we can down designate some of the land that is currently uh, indicated as suburban uh, urban residential to limit the, the growth in any particular area uh, I'll start with that and again I think I'll turn it back over to, to, to Jennifer um, yes yeah, so it was part of this uh, conference review uh, that's a key aspect of what we'll be looking at in the next phase of work when we come back to you in uh, early in the new year uh, a key um, a key part of that work will be looking at employment uh, lands. And so there's a number of conversion applications right now to convert employment areas. So these industrial areas that we're speaking of to non-employment uses. Um, and there's a range of different scenarios that are being looked at by applicants when it comes to conversions. Um, and then the other aspect of this is looking at, we're looking at the overall amount of growth that we're projecting to 51 uh, on the residential side. Do we have the appropriate amount of land to accommodate that? And is that land uh, currently in the right locations and, and do we have enough? And so those are, uh, those are aspects of, uh, that you mentioned that we'll be looking at in the next phase of work. Thank you. Just one more question, Mr. Mayor. Sure you can. Yeah, the, so you talked about allocations. How do we go about influencing the allocations that you've shown us in this draft document? Well, I think um, back to some of the comments that Jennifer made, um, 
ensuring that you've got uh, phasing policies in place, the lands are, you've got servicing, uh, you know, servicing plans in place to accommodate uh, development. Cause we're talking, you know, here about typically large, large scale plans of subdivision um, within urban areas, not always large, but some of them will be large scale. You, the, so there'll need to be proper servicing, you know, staging and phasing plans. When it comes to the rural area or the rural settlements, it's a little, um, it's a little less, um, uh, I guess, structured in terms of how you can, how you can quantify that um, and and direct that precisely. Like, as as planners and land economists, we don't really have the precision to say you're we're going to get, you know, five units in Tula Heights and we're going to get, you know, ten units in Canesville. We we're suggesting that the growth is primarily being uh, allocated to to the two primary urban urban centers of or urban urban areas of St. George and Paris, but there's nothing preventing you from um, it's a it's a it's generally a guideline. There's nothing preventing you from going a little bit a little bit higher um, or a little bit lower. It's just it's generally the the, the plan that we're trying to um, to set out within some level of accuracy. Yeah, I, at the bottom, of my concern it reflects what I hear from uh, the residents of Paris. They they want Paris to become less the focus of growth. Uh, in order to do that, you've got to grow somewhere else if you've got to hit your 59,000 target. And I think that there are two or three big decisions that this council has to get to grips with. One is, do we expand urban settlement boundaries? I think in, in Paris, it's, it's potentially full. If you look to somewhere like Burford or Canesville, there's a lot of land that is, is already designated as uh, suburban or urban residential. Uh, and the choice we have to make is, do we want to service that? And that's a big choice to make, but this is a 30-year plan. So we shouldn't be confined or constrained by the thoughts of, I wouldn't do it tomorrow, but I might do it in 10 years. And, and I think we need to see the entirety of the options that are open to us before we overload uh, the, the, the two urban settlement areas that you've indicated, one being Paris and the other being St. George. Yeah, it's a great comment, Councillor Bell. Um, it's a little premature for us to, for me to sort of opine on the specifics of the land needs assessment at this stage, because we still have to go through that, that second phase of work. But it does appear right now when we look at what's in the uh, development pipeline, as I mentioned, and planning applications that are draft approved or proposed within areas that are designated, uh, within uh, the designated greenfield areas in um, in Paris and St. George, as well as some opportunities in the built-up areas that will likely be able to accommodate the majority of this growth, if not all of this growth for residential within the existing urban settlement areas without expanding boundaries. That, that, that's I, my expectation. I don't, I don't want to um, preclude or you know, uh, presume too much yet, but that's, um, that's where we think this is, um, the results are likely heading. So if I may ask one request of, of planning, uh, and maybe it comes back to, to your company, uh, Jamie, could I see a specific forecast for Paris, recognizing where we are today, recognizing all of the subdivisions and developments that we have already approved? I'd like to see a forecast of population growth over the next 10, 20, 30 years. My gut feeling is that we have underestimated in the work you've done, the rate of growth in Paris. And with it comes the perennial problem and perennial complaint that we get from our residents that we're not keeping up with growth in Paris, that we're overloading existing infrastructure. And I really would like to be able to turn to my residents and say, that's what it looks like. Draw, you can draw conclusions from that, but we have not seen that picture painted for us. I really would like to see it. Um. Councilor Bell, just to respond, we do have uh, a package was pre prepared um, by, by Watson Associates. I believe um, Jennifer and the planning department have circulated that package, which provides more details on the growth allocations by urban area. But more will be provided as we get into the results of the, uh, the technical work of the MCR. So there'll be a bigger write up that's going to explain this in more detail. But there is some preliminary forecasting that's been provided to start with answering that question. I, I did see that and I appreciate that, but just as we've sat around our council table and we've scored off 800 homes in Granville phase through, 
phase three, we've scored off 500 homes in the Nith Peninsula. We scored off 700 homes in the Paris Grand. We scored off another 400 in the other side of the north end of Paris. They're all there. They're already going, and and the the, the pace with which they will reach their um, build out, I think, is faster than you have estimated. I think we're going to see a much larger number of people in Paris than you have estimated. And I think that throws out the allocation issues that uh, we talked about earlier. Uh, well, definitely, um, we, we definitely would be happy to take comments on the allocations um, to to re-examine them or to, you know, to make sure that uh, the final allocation is something that we're all comfortable with. Because again, that is one area where we have the, uh, the, the benefit of choice and uh, it's really a, you know, a, a made in the County of Brant solution in terms of how we want to allocate growth within limits, because obviously we have provincial policy and, and county policy that will direct where growth should go. So um, if there's more growth that should be in Paris, I'm assuming that would come out of St. George, um, because we don't have a lot of growth in the rural area. So um, well, there really isn't that many options, I guess, when you break it down uh, the way that it's been laid out in, in the uh, in the MCR, that you've got two two urban centers and the remaining rural area. So I guess the, if I could ask a question, would is that what you're suggesting, Councillor Bell, that more growth would be going to Paris outside of uh, away from St. I'm suggesting we I'm suggesting you have underestimated the short-term growth of population in Paris. I'm suggesting that we should not overload uh, Paris with further growth. I'm suggesting that we look seriously at spreading out the growth to that 59,000 number foot more across the, the whole of the county, which principally would be looking at Burford, it would be looking at Canesville, uh, where there are opportunities for providing um, municipal servicing. So we're actually looking at the, both of those areas right now and they seem to be understated in your allocation process okay thank, thank you, you councillor bell thank you thank you councillor the ferrier please thank you uh mr mayor uh i have one question to staff and, and maybe one or two comments after but um i guess this would probably be through you to jennifer um i was doing some some uh looking up on the el pad omb uh, website and i've seen in, in our recent history as a county we've been at appeal with development at least 44 times in, again, recent history. Um, and some of that, just to explain to folks watching at home, some of that is us pushing against uh, what some developers want. And some of that is developers pushing against what we want in terms of we haven't answered fast enough or we haven't uh, uh, given them enough builds or whatever it might be. Um, and you were just saying recently, uh, like 10 minutes ago or so, that that creates a bit of an issue like we're having now where we're seeing, um, a sort of a, a crest of some development, um, you know, beyond the 400 or 600. Um, Councillor Bell just eloquently went through all the different numbers. Um, how can we streamline that within the current system so that we get less of those ups and downs and have it be more predictable um, and more, um, I guess, less surprising? That, that's my question. Then I have a comment. Jennifer, could you help us out with that? Thank you very much for the question uh, to you, Mayor Bailey, to Councillor Leferrier. Um, so that's a really good question because uh, what you've just explained, Councillor, has put the county in quite a predicament the last uh, 10 years. Um, what it's done is it's uh, shifted the allocation of growth and the time frame of, of when it's supposed to happen, all through jamming through a, a, a bottleneck at the same time is what's happened. And um, you've heard our legal counsel come to you over the past, uh, like basically the past year and a half over and over again uh, with trying to deal with settlement hearings on, on past appeals actually related to some of it, the 2012 official plan, uh, most recently uh, St. George as well. Um, so, so the one issue is as planners is, is what we deal with um, when either Council makes a decision uh, or there's a timing issue with the Planning Act application or whatever it does, it, it goes to the LPAT. Um, what that does is there's such a time lag in what that hearing does is um, it takes usually a couple of years um, before the hearing actually happens and then staff time. And an outcome usually doesn't happen on average between uh, two to four years. Um, and then 
uh, LPAT decides, and uh, you can draw your own conclusions uh, with the actual state of uh, sort of the, the surmise of what's going on with LPAT in terms of housing and uh, our government that's in power at the moment um, in terms of the stance that's been taken. Um, you've heard recently uh, what's going on in terms of the environment and our, and our conservation authorities. So, so really it's about uh, development and housing. So a couple things, um, anything that goes to LPAD is a problem for the county. It costs time, money, and resources. Um, and it costs a fortune to deal with. How do we avoid that? Um, dealing with a new official plan, uh, something that's not appealable, and having extremely strong and robust policy framework, that's not debatable. And um, I've had several conversations with uh, many of you in council and uh, I think it was Councillor Howes, one of the best uh, lines I've heard is that, how do we have a plan in front of us that the public understands, the development community understands that when council makes a decision on development um, or some sort of policy framework that, that we have a proper framework in place and it's really not debatable. Um, this is what we have, um, whether it's uh, in terms of a new development, a complete communities framework, uh, mixed use provisions, affordable housing, because we can do that as well. Um, so there's those type of things, but we really just want to avoid going to LPAT in the future. Uh, it causes so many problems for the county. Um, it takes a lot of time and money, and the outcome is poor. Um, every single time, the county loses, no matter what, if we actually win. It's just, it's a time frame lag, and we need to avoid that in the future. Um, that's my two cents. I don't know if uh, Jamie wants to. I appreciate to... that. <laughs> Did you have a second question, Councillor Lafayette? I, I have some comments if Jamie's not going. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Jamie, did you want to reply to that or add on no, to? I, I have nothing for the dad. Um, all right. Thank you. So, so, so my comment, Mr. Mayor, is just for all of us on council. And um, I've been told again and again, whenever there's been a para specific issue, sometimes very well meaning and sometimes condescendingly that you know, we represent the entire county. And I truly believe that. Uh, that said, how goes Paris is how we'll go St. George and how we'll go Burford eventually, because one day a provincial government will say, okay, great, you did your 59,000. Now we don't need another 30,000. Where's that gonna go? It's gonna go to Burford and Canesville. And yeah, some of us around this table won't be here to see it, but some of us will. And how we fight um, for Paris is how we need to fight for St. George and how we need to fight for Canesville and Burford and all those other places, right? If we're gonna represent the county, we need to represent the county as a whole. And I've heard things in the past from this council that are easy to see on YouTube, things like, you know, the, the folks in Canesville shouldn't have to be inconvenienced by masks so the folks in Paris can be safe by, from tourists and stuff like that, that is so antithetical to that piece about us representing the entire county, and it bothers me. One of the things that we have to, I think, really look at with this and with the numbers, and I, I, I challenge all of us, because if we're having a review of our um, elections or proportional representation, our numbers, our wards, all of that's coming to review. And I think this report has to really take a, a prominent place in that decision-making. When we look at the amount of growth and where it's going, I think we also have to look at how that representation goes. You know, Paris has about 40% of the representation on council in terms of actual wards. Maybe that needs to be something we look at if we're getting 68% of the growth here over the next 30 years. And we have to look at it in that long-term, but as a whole county. Right, I, I think there, there, we really need to all come to terms with what that growth means and where it's situated, not just in terms of traffic, but in terms of governance. And uh, I think we have quite the task ahead of us. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, how is your next, please? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question was going to be related to Jennifer's comments about the official plan uh, not being appealable, but I think in her answers to Mark, I think uh, my question has been answered. Thank you. Councillor Gatward, you're next then, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to Mr. Cook. <laughs> um, Councillor Bell thinks that your um, estimates are on the low side for growth and the speed of growth. Um, and the numbers are too low. 
I keep thinking about the pandemic and how that's affected our economy and people um, are holding on to their dollars um, because they don't know what the future holds. Um, you said office space, for instance, is up in the air because so many people are working from home and it's turning out quite well. Um, so there is lots of reasons why an economy and other factors can slow the rate of growth that's predicted because that's exactly what happened when we developed Southwest Paris a number of years back. It was said it would build out and Paris would double in size by this time. And it didn't. It didn't because the economy took a downturn. And because of that, some of those subdivisions out there were put on hold. Now, the economy has been booming before pandemic. And the results of that, the building started again. And we have a government, as Jennifer pointed out, that's very development friendly. So who knows what could happen in the next election, provincial election, and things could change with, with the economy and the growth might not build out as much as we think it's going to. Things will slow down, the building will slow down. That's what happened before and history repeats itself. So those are my comments, Mr. Mayor. And as far as the, the representation that Councillor Laferriere mentioned, that's a discussion for another meeting. I have lots of thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gatward. Is there any other speakers? No, seeing none. Jennifer, do you want to? Oh, Councillor McAlpine. I thought I should say something. <laughs> I just was going to say that I appreciate the work the staff have been doing on this. And I do appreciate the, um, the struggles that Paris have undergone over the last you know, 10 years, really, uh, with the growth and the rate of growth and the, with LPAT. And I think through this process, we're giving us the tools so that when we go to develop St. George, we'll be able to do it in a much more managed um, fashion more in our favor. Um, when I ran, I never, I always told people that I wasn't going to be able to stop growth, but my plan was to be able to manage growth. And I think that's where Paris has really been put in a hard place over the last several years. Um, my gut feeling is just sort of what Councillor Bell or yeah, John said um, that Paris is going through a a real spike in growth probably over the next five years. But I think in essence, the worst is almost behind you because the planning's done there now, and now it's just a matter of doing it. And so I think hopefully anyway, over the next couple of years, you'll start seeing your uh, workload lessen, whereas mine in uh, St. George will be a lot higher. Um, but hopefully through management, we can communicate that a lot better with our, uh, our constituents. So I just wanted to say that. I think it was something we needed to hear tonight. I think when the development does happen in other places than Paris, we are going to need friends all over the county to help us manage it better. I don't think any of us really knew what 5,700 houses look like um, when we ran for council. I don't know that we actually um, understood the, the the new roads and, and the dust and the street lights and all of the things that needed to be done and it, it's one thing to hear that you're you have to grow and i knew that we when we ran when back in 2018 that you know this was going to happen but until you actually see the nuts and bolts of, of everything happening you you can't imagine it and what, every night when i come home to saint george i i picture rest acres road um, on either side of Highway 5 from, 
from the two lane cutoff there in St. George. And I, may, I try to imagine it and it's going to happen. And it's, it's, it's like the calm before the storm. And it's, it's hard to imagine and it's, it's unsettling to know that it's going to happen. But the nice thing about what's happened to Paris in my mind is that we, we, we just had to try to manage it and slow it down. It, it's um, something that was decided uh, before us I'm not that we're trying to put the blame on someone else, but truly it wasn't our decisions that made it happen. And it is our decisions to carry it forward. And I think Councillor Bell is, is right. I think that the numbers are underestimated. I think Paris has grown as big as it needs to grow and probably a little bit more. And um, to, to say it's all going to happen in St. George, I don't think that's realistic either. I think you're going to find Canesville is going to do things that we don't, we, we can't imagine right now. In the next couple of years, and uh, all the all the all the little places in between, you know, Kelvin and, and just all the little towns, Harrisburg could get some growth. And I, I don't think it's as concentrated as Paris and St. George. And in my mind, it's not anyway. And I do drive along and I try to imagine all these different roads that just look like they're going to be Rest Acre, Rest, Rest Acres Road or Bishopsgate Road someday. And it's it's uh, it's coming. And I, I really do think Councillor Bell is right. I, I believe that um, Paris is growing uh, faster than people have thought it would. Councillor Gatward. Yeah, one last thing that I wanted to mention and forgot, and you reminded me with your comments, Mr. Mayor. If we hadn't redesignated the industrial lands in the north end of Paris to residential. And Brookfield was the one particular developer who started that avalanche out there of homes. Then there wouldn't be as many homes out there as there is now. I did not support, I do not support down designating if we have land designated employment or industrial in the county it should be left that way it should not be turned into housing because that's what happens what happened in the north end of paris and and the developers will try and tell us oh you've got too much employment land designated that's what they said and so the council of the day except for two of us voted to change it to residential and and there's what you get so we need to be very careful in this official plan and keep our industrial land and don't let the developers talk us into putting it into residential they want it residential because i can make lots of money but it, our community shouldn't be about that, making developers rich. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councillor Gatward. And I think that if things are slowing down as far as questions, uh, I would just like to add something optimistic at the end of all of this. And, and because of all this development and all the aggravation and all the uh, uh, d inconveniences of what's happening in Paris and, and on certain side roads around the county, we are in a position in this pandemic to have some some funds available to us through the developmental charges. And I belong to the Ontario Wardens Association and there, there are municipalities in Ontario right now that have no development and they have no money and they have no choices um, moving forward. And they're in the middle of the same pandemic that we are with zero money in the bank and zero options for moving forward. So if there's any kind of a glass half full in this whole scenario of of things that we don't want to see happening around us that we can't do anything about right now. We have some money and, and we have options to, to make things a little bit better for everyone in the county um, by, by being able to update and, and keep things current and, and, uh, and move forward. Uh, you know, inter the internet's getting better. We're, we're developing all kinds of things in the county, green things and, and modern things and more modern things. Uh, and it's all because of the, the fact that we have some money. And so if at the end of the day, that's all we can say about it right now, then at least it's something positive to end tonight's meeting on, I believe. 
Uh, I'll turn it back over if there's no other questions to Jennifer. Uh, and, and also thank our guests for coming tonight and to uh, to let us know the numbers. We, we sort of knew what they were. Uh, sometimes we need to hear it from someone else to make it a reality. And uh, I'll hand it over to Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, I believe that wraps up tonight. Uh, we appreciate all your questions. And we do have uh, a recommendation on the table. So I'd like to, obviously through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I'll lead you off in terms of uh, that recommendation and I'll ask our, our clerk. Um, and also in terms of the discussion tonight, um, I believe like I've talked to several of you as well, if there's uh, any motions or changes to that, if you wanna direct staff to look at anything beyond that recommendation, but I'll turn it to you over to Mr. Mayor to discuss with our clerk about the recommendation. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you to everyone that's on the call tonight, staff wise. Uh, you're doing a great job um, with all the all the conditions we're putting on you and the pandemic. So to even make these meetings happen is it, we appreciate it and uh, stay safe. And I'm going to hand it over now to Councillor McAlpine for the recommendation, please. Okay. Move by myself and second by Council House that staff report RPT-20-229 new official plan municipal comprehensive review preliminary findings and recommendations growth scenario be approved and scenario one growth plan scenario be approved as the basis for the municipal comprehensive review of the new county of Brant official plan. Thank you, Councillor. Is everyone clear? Any questions before we call the vote? Are you hands in the air to call the vote? Are we voting or questions? Councillor Pierce, you're first. Councillor Bell, you're second. Thank you. So just, just for clarification here, this is for the, the growth plan of population as opposed to the growth plan of employment, or is this both? Because as I said earlier, I would like to do scenario one as far as growth of population, but scenario two as far as the numbers for employment. I just want to be clear what I'm voting on here. Thank you. Jennifer, can you, can you make it clear on, on what the vote is all about? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, for Councillor Pierce. Um, I'll have our consultant, Jamie, jump in after this, but what you have in front of you in terms of a recommendation is for uh, scenario one, which is the reference forecast. Um, so that was the 59,000 population and 26,000 jobs. Um, if there is a change to that, because that would be the scenario that's actually in schedule three of the growth plan. Right. So that is the actual recommendation tonight with those two numbers. So, sorry, Jennifer. So if I could, Mr. Mayor, through you. So yeah. if we vote to approve this, then there's no way to change the employment numbers, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Pierce. So as we both said, uh, Jamie and myself, is that that's actually a, a floor, a minimum. So there's a potential that we could go higher uh, for both population and employment. Um, but I'm going to have to ask Jamie to see if we can actually revise the number tonight or you to direct staff to look at. Jamie? So I'll just have Jamie jump in uh, for that answer. Um, I think to keep it simple, like to me, the, uh, the recommendation is scenario one. But as you said, Jennifer, that there's nothing. In inhibiting us um, to exceeding that number because it is a floor. So um, I think to be fair when it comes to both population and employment, scenario one, we've looked at this comprehensively and objectively. It, it does represent, I think, the most appropriate level of growth looking at historical trends, county share of growth, as well as the drivers that we think are going to influence growth. If we should see more growth happening on employment, nothing uh, preventing us from planning for that growth um, and over time we can monitor this and um, if it's clear that we're tracking higher unemployment we can uh, we can look at uh, a higher rate of growth we can, we can even um, well we're, we're gonna we're gonna look at this several times you know before the end of this horizon so uh, that's my recommendation um, in terms of how we would put this forward Okay, so and, um, thank you th through you, Mr. Mayor, if I could. So yep. 
<laughs> in no way, shape, or form do I want to increase the number of population. Let's get that perfectly straight. What I would like to do is increase the increase the employment numbers. So um, I just want to I just want to make perfectly clear for the population we don't have a choice but to plan for those. But for the employment, we can plan to increase that number. That's the that's the point I want to make here. Is is I would like to look at 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 us looking at increasing the plan for employment numbers only, not population. So as long as that's possible with me voting to approve this, I'm all for it. I just want to make sure I can do one without the other. Yeah. Councillor Bell. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. My, my question is not totally unrelated. Uh, I believe we're voting for two numbers for targets or forecasts for 2051. We're not voting for the shape of the curve of those numbers or those, um, uh, the population and, and the employment growth between now and then. It's just the end number that we're agreeing. So how we get there is still open to our uh, best efforts. That's right. Thank you. Councillor Gatward, you're next and then Councillor Leferrier. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, we can always go higher in employment. And if we do, good for us. Um, Mr. Cook said earlier in his presentation, we don't have a lot of shovel ready land. I think that when we did the 403 business park and made shovel ready land, it was a good thing for the county. It helped keep our tax residential taxes lower. And it certainly sold out uh quicker than we thought it would so i'm very proud of that uh, business part the fact that it was successful and i think if we want more employment we need to get shovel ready land and we can realize what councillor pierce is looking for higher numbers doesn't matter how high we go but the two are tied together so if you don't want more population you don't want to set a higher um, employment number councillor pierce that's the way i'm interpreting staff and um, mr cook's comments thank you thanks councillor gatward councillor ferrier uh, will be the last question Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question is more of one, uh, I'm a little cautious, and, and the only reason, I understand that today we have two choices, a higher target or a lower target, and I'm going to support the lower target, and I think everybody is going to. That said, if we vote on this, does this preclude us if in the future, and as people have said, who knows how the future goes, if the province, uh, whatever shape and form it takes, if they were to say, you know what, we've decided that um, the floor can be lowered, does this does do we exclude ourselves from being able to opt into a lower floor in the future i know it's a highly unlikely the floor will be lowered but if you know miracle of miracles <laughs> the floor is lowered are we precluding ourselves do we need maybe an amendment of some kind to say you know that you know precluding any um lowering of the floor and this is where i wish, wish councillor chambers was here because he could probably write it in his sleep um but do we need an amendment of some sort to to make sure that we're not stuck with this if things change. And what I mean by that is if our higher level of government allows us a lower floor, I don't want this to bind us to a higher floor. Can, can somebody on staff, I don't know if it's a, a Jennifer or a Matt or a Michael or whoever uh, answer, but can somebody feel that? Jennifer, Jennifer, do you want to try that one? Yeah, to you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Laferriere. Absolutely, so the county has to conform to provincial policy. And as you saw this year, uh, we've had three pieces of provincial policy be amended and the provincial policy statement, the growth plan, and also the land needs assessment documents, we have to conform and therefore we have to do an official plan amendment. It just happens to be that we're going through a municipal comprehensive review and new official plan at this time. Um, in May 2019, the growth plan amendment came in and then this year they brought in another amendment. We have to constantly be catching up. Um, we're just in a good position right now to do that. 
Uh, if there's a change in government in two years and they amend the growth plan yet again, we will have to do another official plan amendment. But the biggest thing is, as uh, uh, Jamie said tonight, is that we have to revise our growth forecasting every five years. We have to do a municipal comprehensive review every 10 years. Um, so as Jamie said, there is going to be three additional municipal comprehensive review in the next 30 years in our time horizon. Lots of chances to constantly revise and catch up. This is not set in stone tonight. It's for today moving forward. Um, we have a pandemic, we have disruptors, we have economic things. Who knows what will happen in five years, but we will always be uh, ready to uh, amend to provincial policies and what's happening with economic drivers as well. So yes, thank you. So, so just, just to clarify for my silly non-planner brain, if if the province decides to lower the floor in, in sometime between now and the next five years, in that five year period of time, we can go with an amended lower plan if the province dictates that's acceptable. Jennifer? Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. We would have to conform to that change. Thank you. Thank you. I think after Jennifer has spoke, I, I, I think I feel comfortable enough to call the vote. It's on the floor, it has a seconder. All those in favor of adoption? Opposed? Thank you, it's passed. Again, thank you to everyone who came tonight um, to present to us. If there's nothing else, uh, number six on the agenda is communications. We have none. Other business, there was none in camera. We're not going there. Next meeting is December the 15th. If there's nothing else for the betterment of the County of Brant, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Pierce, thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you, everyone. Have a great hey, night. everybody. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, staff. That was uh, informative. Yeah.